Okay, uh, welcome to another episode of Counter Hegemonic Chats. Today, we're going to be discussing the late Samir Amin, uh, particularly his uh, views on the Arab Spring and uh, his understanding of imperialism. Today, I'm going to be discussing an article by Tim Anderson, who I have with me here, uh, Samir Amin, Imperialism and the Arab Spring. So, Tim, it seems like you, you, uh, you agree with um, Samir Amin in terms of what he's against, but you highlight that there's um, that he doesn't really he doesn't really talk too much about what he's for or what uh, what people should support in the Middle East. It's more about what he's against. Would you think that's a fair characterization? I think that uh, Samir Amin, who is Egyptian French and has been very influential, was very influential over some decades writing about imperialism to a European, largely European Marxist audience, although to some extent in developing countries also. <clears throat> I think he goes, he's better than a lot of the, the Western Marxist analysts on the Arab Spring, but he doesn't really recognise the actual form of the resistance in the Arab world. I think he missed it there. But let's start with the, the positives. I think he got this right about imperialism back in 2011, which a lot of Western Marxists missed. Um, and yep. I think we're going to go on to discuss that those sort of failings, really. Effectively, they were suckered for the, the new colour revolution at that time. So Samir Amin was talking in his book, The Reawakening of the Arab World, came out in 2011. So he was just completing it as the events in Egypt and so on were unfolding. I, I guess the destruction of Libya was happening. The, the war in Syria was not that obvious in early 2011 because it was more or less uh, localised and didn't become a much bigger thing until later that year, even early 2012. But Amin was writing in 2011, um, there was a coherent plan to destroy the Syrian state in a manner modelled on the United States' work in Iraq mm. and Libya. For the US, the goal is breaking up of the Iran-Syria-Hezbollah alliance, which is an obstacle to the US entrenching its control over the region. For Israel, the goal is to have Syria fragmented into sectarian mini-states. For the Gulf Arab states, like Saudi Arabia, the goal is the entrenching of a Sunni dictatorship in the Wahhabi style, that sectarian backward style of, of supposed Islam, established on the massacres and criminal elimination of the Alawis, Druze and Christians, the, all of the, the large minorities in Syria. And Turkey plays an active role in the implementation of that plan. Now, I think a lot of the the axis of resistance analysts and yourself and myself would agree to a large extent with that characterization of the aim of imperialism in back at that time. Um, it's, it's when we start talking about the resistance that the differences arise, basically. And he really, he has a very jaundiced view. He doesn't really think much of uh, bourgeois, any form of bourgeois nationalism, which I suppose is shared by the Trotskyists, of course, but he's not a Trotskyist. He, he's better than that. Um, what are your thoughts about that? How, how did you see his characterization of the the aim of imperialism back in two thousand and eleven? I think I think it's um, it's correct in terms of he's able to identify what the imperial strategy is. So breaking up of the Iran Syria Hezbollah alliance. This is uh, something that you and I have said. Uh, Sharmin Narwani has said. Amal Saad Gurayev has said. So many analysts in the Middle East um, would agree with that uh, that particular line of reasoning. Um, and I think it's important for a lot of people in the West who respect Samir Amin, or at least uh, think they do, and then at the same time um, uh, take a take a side against the Syrian government. They should know what his actual opinions were in terms of the the strategy. Having said that, what I find interesting is that uh, you quote McHugo, who uh, I believe is a conservative, and he seems to have more of an appreciation for. The achievements of uh, of the government in Syria under the under the Ba'ath Party. So, yeah, uh, he says well, that ninety five percent and some of the others, uh, some of the let's say the more honest uh, reactionary or conservative analysts, um, while condemning you know all of the Arab resistance, basically um, on the one hand, are honest enough to recognise that some extraordinary changes took place in that post-colonial period. And if we're talking about Syria, this is particularly under the, the administration of Hafez al-Assad, who was president in the, the 70s, 80s and 90s, three decades effectively. Some uh, massive, dramatic changes, maybe we'll come to them uh, in a moment, you know. But um, he was honest enough to do that. I think uh, Amin skipped over those, basically. And it's interesting to see that 
at least even some of the honest conservatives are able to recognise some extraordinary advances because the, the point I made in that article was I don't think you can point to any colonial administration that ever, for example, uh, lifted, brought on electricity from 5% to 95% of the rural areas, that brought on universal education. What colonial administration or neo-colonial administration ever sent all the kids to school? Was there any? I, I can't think of one myself, basically. Absolutely. And this is where um, I have... Uh... I have appreciate. I, I remember reading about Samir Amin uh, talking about, for example, socialist countries. Right. So um, there's. So for example, with the Soviet Union, he recognised that they transferred capital from the wealthy areas to the poor areas, and he seems to. And I think this is something that he's able to to recognise about socialist countries. And he has pointed out, for example, that Western powers never did the same thing with their colonies. Um, so he knows the, that Western countries have actively underdeveloped the countries that were colonized. But I think you're right. I think there's uh, there's a failure to appreciate how much post-colonial governments have actually achieved. And maybe the reason for that is if you're writing for a Western audience, because we live in a Western hegemonic society, and because Western countries uh, have the publications and the news outlets, then it's kind of difficult to detect the improvements that have been made under post-colonial administrations. So China, for example, right? I mean, it's difficult to, to recognize the achievements of China if you live in a country like Australia. Now, I think that's gonna change because China's in the next 10 years gonna have significantly better living standards than what they have in the United States, um, or at least that's my prediction. And so when, you, when it comes to like a country like Syria, which, uh, which hasn't had the same level of success economically as China, uh, it becomes harder to understand where they came from. But in terms of life expectancy, education, the status of women, uh, Syria punched above its weight. I can't think of any other Arab state um, that had Syria's level of income, which is like a lower to middle income bracket, but managed to achieve so much. So it punched mm -hmm. above its weight in terms of the per capita income that it had. And yeah, it's difficult to, to appreciate this uh, if you live in the West. And uh, if you look at someone like Samir Amin, of course, he was he was alive to Western sensibilities, but he had a foot in both camps. He also went and spoke in Cuba, in Venezuela and other countries like that. I, I was at a I remember being at one conference with him in Caracas, you know, with uh, with Hugo Chavez there. And but of course, the difference is that Hugo Chavez, when the Arab Spring comes along, particularly as regards Syria, both Chavez and Fidel Castro in Cuba immediately saw that they had to defend an independent Syria. I mean, the Cubans had fought with Syria against Israel in the past. You know, they had a long history. They understood practically what resistance was, and they understood what the value of an independent state was. I think, by contrast, if you're talking about a Western Marxist audience, there's a lot of idealism, which is about this is capitalism and that is socialism. There's a very big, uh, you know, mm. polemic where people have it clear in their minds, sort of like a religious mission that this can't be socialism, everything is capitalism, you know, and there isn't any sense that, well, what's the value of an independent uh, uh, state, you know, exercising some political will and producing some benefits for its people. I think in Latin America, the those that had been involved in constructing progressive states, um, socialist states, if you like, or even introducing social democratic reforms, realised that independence and actually uh, concrete popular initiatives were of value and they didn't downplay that even it was for example little honduras in central america that had a center right government but decided pragmatically that they would go into an alliance with venezuela and cuba because it was for the the benefit of the people there of course they didn't have a political base to support that there was a there was a coup and uh, the, the then center right president was overthrown but nevertheless uh, you know, the Fidel and Chavez at that time had always tried to foment that type of change and that type of, and, and they recognised that independence from his imperialism was absolutely critical to establishing those sort of changes. And it needed some political will, first of all, to push the changes through, and second of all, to defend them once the, once the changes were there. And that was mm. basically incompatible with a Western liberal or let's say libertarian socialism view of the world, which said, well, you can't really have a, a strong state here. You have to have a, a weak state. <clears throat> and of course, unfortunately, we've seen the examples of Libya and Chile under Allende and others that weren't able to defend their changes and were steamrolled by uh, imperialism. So that's why <clears throat> the strength of a state to 
or I call it in some of the other things I've written, a human right, a strong human rights enabling state to be able to push through important initiatives and to defend them is actually more important than someone's theoretical idea about what is what is an idealistic form of socialism and does this conform to my ideals or not? Yeah, I mean, Marxists, uh, I think, have a tendency to um, to compare existing societies to perfection. And so naturally, the, the, the imperfect reality is never going to live up to the imaginary ideal. Um, and so that brings up a question, what is the role of people who call themselves Marxist, socialist, anti-imperialist in Western countries, in your opinion? Well, it's not a very pretty history, you know, but on the other hand, there are movements, there are social democratic movements, let's say, short of democratic socialist movements that have, for example, pushed through public health systems. Now, some idealistic types think, oh, you can't have a decent public health system under capitalism. No, you can. There's, there's important differences between countries. Um, you know, those of us that study comparative international systems and health systems and so on see that the big differences between a US-styled system and a Western European-styled system where, for all of their faults, they have been able to buffer their populations from important sort of storms mm. in the international sphere and also in terms of the market forces, in terms of uh, basic social services and so on. So uh, it is uh, those sorts of things, the groundswell behind creating those sorts of social advancements or free education, for example, or um, or free public health systems, for example, those sort of things are important. And sometimes, of course, you know, there's a, it's taken a broad left um, populist movement to push those things forward. Um, but, you know, uh, more broadly, um, the anti-war movement, it's been important. That you have to say that the, the left has been important in anti-war. That's why it's such a big disappointment when you see sections of what used to be called the left supporting war in the name of the, the latest colour revolution, whether it's in Eastern Europe or the Balkans or in the Middle East. I mean, time after time, uh, for example, the Trotskyists of the world fell into this trap of effectively, because they'd been in that situation with the Soviet Union, I guess, historically, that they were more anti-Soviet than than the US in the Cold War, basically. Yeah, um, they, and I think I think there's, oh, sorry, continue. No, they, they, they undermined that and, and then uh, they effectively sided up with the US against the Soviet Union. And so they effectively, they sided with the US against Libya, against Syria, <clears throat> against Iran, you know, against Yugoslavia. So there, there was, there's really a very sorry history on that side of the left. But the left, in other, in, in its better moments, has been an anti-war force. It's been a force for supporting um, democratic rights in the workplace, for example, and supporting some progressive changes like public health systems. But you can't identify uh, in Western countries actual substantial breakthroughs in the manner of um, the the popular unity government in Chile or the the Chavistas in Venezuela or even even to an extent some of the movements in Africa that were revolutionary um, you can't identify those things happening in the West they faced a different sort of state a state that was very embedded with elites and and subsequently capitalist elites yeah and um, the I think the difficulty that that a lot of people have in the West is realizing what their role is. So when I look at the, the post-colonial world, my impression is that my role as someone who lives in the West is to try and get the, the jackboots of the, the predatory alliance to which Australia belongs off the necks of the post-colonial world. That's our primary obligation. Whereas I think a lot of leftists think that their obligation is to give advice to countries. So for example, they look at Cuba and their primary I mean, I think Cuba is 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 seen in a in a far more positive light than in a lot of other countries. So if we stick with Syria, they look at a country like Syria and they think, well, my job is to give you condescending advice from above on how to run your society and condemn mm -hmm. you for not being socialist enough. Whereas I look at Syria and I think it's none of my business, right? Like it's not any of my business to 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 criticize them from from a Western point of view, unless I'm actually living in that country and have a stake in it. Uh, my opinion doesn't really matter. Where my voice matters the most is precisely in doing something to end the predatory aggression against this country that mm. Australia is, is complicit in. I think you've identified something very important, and that is its voice analysis, that 
we do have a voice. All of us have a voice in some way. And uh, at least theoretically, there is some accountability in our own system. So when our own government is involved, for example, in a military aggression against Afghanistan, Iraq, Syria, Palestine, Yemen, then we have a responsibility to um, hold that government to account and to, to criticise it there. But to, you know, it doesn't mean to say that we are um, and we don't have a voice. Uh, we can't properly say, look, we support the Ansarala government in Yemen. I mean, maybe we like it. Maybe we have different opinions about it. Maybe there's some things we like about it and some things we don't. But that's not the point, is it, of international solidarity? Mm. We, it's not proper for us to say that I am, you know, voting for Bashar al-Assad or I'm voting for Ansarala or whatever, or I'm voting for Hassan Nasrallah. But um, we defend uh, principles in, in international relations and we hold our own system to account. I think I think you identified it quite well there in, in terms of your voice analysis. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this is something that I learned from Noam Chomsky, actually, because uh, one of the first books that I read, uh, or I mean, I read most of it, was uh, about the political economy of human rights, and he went over the the, the various atrocities in the third world. And um, <clears throat> it's because of this book that people accused him of being an apologist for Pol Pot. That's what made him kind of, um, that's what made the book uh, controversial in the West among some circles. And he said, you've got some atrocities that the media will will um, be outraged about. And these are what he calls the nefarious atrocities because they're committed by the official enemies of the United States. And he makes a point where he says, it, it, there's no point in me as as a Westerner um, repeating them, like to, to just, just add fuel to the fire because I understand what these atrocity stories are being used for. It's to, it's to facilitate the aggression. You fast forward a few decades, and uh, Noam Chomsky, unfortunately, has jumped on the bandwagon of uh, of supporting the aggression against Syria. Yeah, that was very sad, and um, it wasn't just a one-off thing either, because he did it with Libya, and he consistently did it with Syria, and he consistently um, backed U.S. intervention in Syria on on one pretext or another. The first one was the humanitarian scams that were being run by the U.S. government, and their paid um, uh, voice boxes in groups like Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International, for example. And the second one was jumping on the bandwagon of some sort of uh, new Israel, you know, at the ethnic sovereignty, supposed ethnic sovereignty of Kurdish people. So it mm. was uh, it was a very bad failure in many respects and um, sad coming from someone who had, who had written against, um, a, more or less with a radical liberal analysis, but a very good radical liberal analysis of US foreign policy, and then also a deconstruction of um, the new forms of propaganda, you know, him and Ed Herman. Ed Herman, by the way, had better politics on the Middle East. He had a better yeah. understanding of what was going on there. But they they put up that propaganda model um, in their 1980s book about um, the different elements of, um, of propaganda. By the way, I think the, that theory is superseded to a certain extent, because when I was uh, looking at Venezuela in the early part of this century, I noticed that the, um, you know, you, you can't really reduce it to commercial imperatives. The media these days is not driven by commercial imperatives. I think Chomsky and Herman were saying, look, it's because um, really the corporate media is selling an audience to advertisers. You know, mm. this is the wisdom is they're selling some sort of show to the con to consumers. But he says, no, they're selling an audience to advertisers and the advertisers have got this enormous power. So it's a commercial relationship. And I think there's some truth in that. But when I was in Venezuela, I noticed that the corporate media that had backed the coup against Chavez in 2002 were immediately cut off from government advertising and they were running at a loss. But they kept running because the corporate media are a mouthpiece of a very powerful investor group that wants a voice. And they'll keep that voice going and it's not really where they make the money. You know, if they make any money, it doesn't really matter too much. They'd rather mm. it didn't lose too much money, but they're making their money elsewhere and they want to have a voice in things like, you know, the privatisation of electricity and all those other sorts of important matters to them, basically. So then I realised, no, actually, the corporate media, it's not necessarily really driven by commercial imperatives, except in that broader sense where, you know, the ruling class or the state, as they say in the Marxist tradition, was acting in the interests of the ruling class as a whole and not for a particular profit-making enterprise in the short term, basically. So the media... Yeah, these course, are... It's strategic. It's uh, it's not about, like, making money. It's not like Rupert Murdoch does not have this media empire to make money. He he does it because he's serving a, a strategic uh, 
um, uh, foreign policy. Yeah, well, I mean, he's invested in Israel and all sorts of places too, and all sorts of uh, projects that are <clears throat> influenced by these sorts of war. There, there isn't a war in recent times that Murdoch hasn't supported, and um, it's not just to have sensational headlines and sell more more papers. It's there are real uh, strategic, as you say, interests, long term interests there. There are <clears throat> a money making interests too there, but I think you know even the invasion mm. of Iraq, which a lot of people said, well, this is because. Um, the U.S. wants to get its hands on oil. Remember, the U.S. could buy the oil at favourable terms, more or less, from Saddam Hussein. It wasn't that. They didn't like the fact that Saddam had become a loose cannon, like Manuel Noriega was in Panama, basically, and effectively derailed their strategic control of the region. They had a plan. They still have a plan. My, my latest article is to say that plan is failing very badly, the new Middle East plan, where they wanted to destroy all of the independent will in the region. And uh, Iran was going to be the last stage. But uh, Trump is trying to do it all at once now, but he's more or less losing in every place. You know, he's losing in Iraq. He's losing in Syria. He's losing in Iran. And so he's gone to war with uh, his own base in Iraq. He's, he's put Lebanon into turmoil. All the people that supported the US in Lebanon are now um, distraught because the Lebanese economy is such a mess because, according to them, Lebanon is money laundering for Syria and so on. Now, the Gulf states are also laundering, laundering money for Syria. And Kuwait and, and the UAE, which were funding Takfiri terrorists in, in Syria a few years ago, mm. now reopened their embassies in Damascus and are investing in Syria. And so here's ah. this, new, this new law, the Caesar law, you know, resurrecting an old propaganda scam a few years back to impose greater penalties on the third parties that do business with Syria. Which, what does that mean? The, his allies, the friends, you know, the Europeans that are thinking about normalizing with Syria and the UAE, which is already investing in some large projects. So it's a strange time we live in. One thing that struck me recently was to see that the, the, all of the allies were deserting the, um, the US coalition in Iraq since the killing of Soleimani in January. You know, the, the Danes and a few of the others pulled out because of the, the conflict rising with Iraq and they were scared by the Iraqi missile strike. And then they're saying, oh, it's because of COVID-19, we're withdrawing and so on. 50% of those forces are gone in the last six months. And the US wants to cut its forces in half now. And I, I remembered uh, an interview that Soleimani did last year where he said, when Lebanon invaded, uh, sorry, when Israel invaded Lebanon in 2006, there were 180,000 U.S. troops in the region. 60% of the U.S. military was in the Middle East, um, encouraging the Zionists to think that they might just go in and knock over the Lebanese resistance in a short span of time. Of course, ill-fated as it turns out. But think of that, that there was 180,000 troops there. Now, in Iraq now, there's 5,000. Yeah, Depending 5, on what's cut it by half. In Syria, there's a few hundred, basically. You know, So Trump is talking very loud and... Uh, increasing the economic war but the economic war is affecting everyone now it's it's making mm. a, 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 a disaster case for the people that otherwise wanted to ally themselves within within lebanon within iraq for example um, iraq is under the under the the economic pressure at the moment and uh, lebanon is already suffering seriously so it's strange to see that this war has expanded in its dying days more or less you know what do we make of that that the war failed against Syria because Syria had strong allies, which is always what the US feared. And uh, Russia got involved, Iran got involved, and Trump has widened that war. I guess he's made it obvious, Trump has made it obvious to those that um, didn't see it in the first few years that what this was, that it was connected to the, the regional plan. They told us it was connected to the regional plan. Remember Wesley Clark said it was, they were going to knock over seven countries. Knock out seven Europe. countries, yeah, seven years. And, uh, Condoleezza Rice in Tel Aviv announced the, the new Middle East, you know, which was going to be a haven of freedom and democracy under the US allies, you know, in brackets, Israel and Saudi Arabia, you know. I mean, all of that has become more obvious, I suppose, after almost a decade. But back in 2011, you know, what went wrong, Jay? What went wrong with the Western left? I have a theory. I have a theory. So you mentioned Israel, and that kind of brings me to, um, to my own engagement with the Middle East, which starts off with Palestine. Ever since I was a, a teenager, I used to go to those Palestine rallies. And the message that I uncritically uh, 
swallowed back then was that Palestinians had no friends in the region. Palestinians were were um, were just completely alone against this uh, horrible occupation that had imprisoned them, stolen their land, murdered them, bombed them, and and that all of these countries around them, all of the Arab countries, were essentially selling them out, had sold them out, and I believe that. And in hindsight, I realize why it was necessary within the Western propaganda system to push that, um, frankly, lie, because Western propaganda only respects victimhood. So if you can present for, because the Palestinians are fundamentally a victimized population because they don't have um, a hard state, you know, because they're, they're a colonized people, um, you can support the Palestinians to the extent that they are pure victims, right? Uh, but you can't say the same thing about a hard state like Syria because they've got tanks, they've got sophisticated weapons, they had a, a chemical weapon deterrent before that. And so because of all these reasons, when, they, when, when the Syrian war came about, that propaganda which said that the Palestinians have no friends in the Arab world ended up being weaponized against the Syrian government. So they said, well, the Syrian government has betrayed Palestine. The Syrian government hasn't done enough to, to, to counter Israel. They've been weak. They've sold out. They're not willing to push harder against imperialism. And then that, that's when I, I encounter arguments where people say, well, um, I don't approve of Bashar al-Assad. As I, don't, I don't approve of this idea that Bashar al-Assad is, uh, is anti-imperialist because his credentials don't show it. And that actually uh, uh, made me think. A lot of people seem to think that anti-imperialism is the is the positive identity that are, that the leader of a country takes on. You know, when actually, simply being a country that is under attack from imperialism and having to resist imperialism is by definition anti-imperialist. So there, these are the I, issues that I notice. Yeah. Yeah. Aren't there a couple of factions in that? Um, you know, Palestine is isolated uh, as a victim. Um, thing because in terms of the liberals, I guess the Western liberals, you've got the Western liberals are more or less they only want to support um, a, a victim, and when that victim gets angry, then they get upset and they they go back to the state more or less. You can say the same yeah. thing about the way they see Aboriginal people. Aboriginal people in Australia are victims, but if there's an angry Aboriginal man, all of a sudden, or you know what was that uh, the video? I think it was from Britain. That there were this this cop arresting a an Afri Africa a, a black British guy, and a few others jumped in and they jumped and put the cop on the ground. All of a sudden, all the liberals are horrified. Look at this, you know, and we have no mm. idea what was going on there. Um, it may be that the guy was carrying out some uh, you know brutal arrest. It may have been a threat of violence or something like that. But we've got a video circulating at the moment of. Um, a, a, a an African British guy wrestling this cop to the ground and then being backed up by some friends who are ready to join in. Um, but the, inst the, the instinctive liberal reaction is to immediately back up the police um, and to oppose the right of someone to defend themselves in, in that circumstance, despite the history of all of the, the murder of black people, you know, of unarmed black people, um, more in the US than in Britain. So there's that sort of there's that sort of liberal response to victimhood, but then you've also got the uh, the Trotskyist or the Western, you know, the what we call the imperial left response, which is that um, effectively there is no, um, you know, at the extreme version of it, there is no progressive state in the world effectively. So rip them all mm. down. That's the extreme <laughs> sort of cliffite version. But also, it it comes across to people a bit like some airmen, doesn't it? None of this resistance matters. It doesn't, you know, Syria, you can write off the, the Syrian state, even though imperialism is trying to destroy it and break it up into little sectarian fragments in the interests of Israel. But nothing's going on in Syria, despite the fact that they've unified the country around a nationalist, pluralist identity. They've electrified the countryside. They sent all the kids to school. They've got a free public health system. They've got a... Education is cheap as hell education is cheap or free. I mean, there are private schools, you know, there is a capitalist sector there. So therefore, you know, it's a capitalist state mm. and it means nothing despite all of these other things that the rest of us yeah. fight for decades to achieve. All of that means nothing. No, it means a lot. I remember someone saying in terms of Venezuela that uh, some years ago, doing some calculations that for all of the, the fact that the, the Venezuela has the biggest oil reserve in the world, if you include all of the very crude oil more than Saudi Arabia, 
But nevertheless, the big companies in the US want to get their hands on all of those social services too, the health system and so on, all those things that have been uh, privatized in recent times. There's a huge amount of money in all of those other services, service sectors there, basically. And the state's been putting 60 plus percent of the budget into those social service sectors. They want to suck that back out to all the private interests there, you know. So there are, hmm. there are very important targets in countries like Syria. Um, but notice when the IMF and the World Bank was going through the developing world with the debt crisis in the 80s and 90s, the first thing they were doing was removing subsidies on basic grains, basic foods, cooking oil, those mm. sorts of things, removing all those sorts of subsidies and pushing uh, private partnerships into all those areas to make money out of whatever it was, electricity or health or anything they can sell to you, basically. So, all, uh, so in other words, resistance to that sort of pressure means something. That was a real resistance, which I think Samir Amin had a blind spot to. And I think a lot of the Western Marxist mm. has a blind spot too. Uh, but there's this sort of coalition that comes together, as you say, you know, if we go to a Palestinian rally in Sydney, for example, um, or when we've gone to them in the past, they say, oh, you can't fly the Hezbollah flag or the Syrian flag here because we've all agreed, you know, um, to, you know, tone it down so we can all come together just to support Palestine. <laughs> but, but they were okay with the black flags with Arabic writing on it. <laughs> the, <laughs> the shahada but, flags i mean yeah but, i mean it's an islamic flag but in context i mean it, it yeah it's it tells you about what that what the person who's flying it like what their sympathies are like in the middle east and which side they'd like to win and usually they're on the side of al-qaeda but well, um, i i think is, it's the reality is politically that palestine is lost if it doesn't have any regional regional allies it's completely lost you know it's there's never going to be an independent palestine um, no matter how much support they get from Western liberals or Western Trotskyists, there will never be an independent Palestine unless there's a, there are strong allied neighbours, Lebanon, Syria, um, you know, Egypt, the others, Iran, those countries that have actually armed the resistance. This is why they're hated so much by the, by the Zionists, of course, because they actually give concrete support to the Palestinian resistance and keep, keep that side alive. Yeah, and I think uh, when it comes to the understanding the psychology of the Western left. A lot of it is just class centrism. So this is something I wouldn't really accuse Samir Amin of. He was, he was very well aware that national oppression existed, that um, imperialism is, is a system of national exploitation, that the old colonial powers benefited from the patterns of trade that they had historically established on the basis of, of violence and subjugation. Um, but if you look at the world from a purely, let's say, orthodox Marxist and then a Trotskyist mindset, then there's only class. Class is the only thing that matters. And this is why, for example, when they look at Syria, they see only class. And so Assad becomes bourgeoisie and the, the uprising becomes proletarian. And therefore, you have to side, the proletari side with the proletariat against the bourgeoisie. But if you take, uh, if you want, if you recognize that national oppression exists, then you can look at the bigger picture. You can look at the entire world map and see that actually there's an entire predatory alliance that's arrayed against this country. Well, you've got two things going on there. One is you do, you can use a class analysis, of course, to talk about the Muslim Brotherhood, for example. The Muslim Brotherhood, which has been at the root of the domestic sectarian Islam. <clears throat> is a network of Muslim businessmen, basically. That's essentially what it is, um, a merchant class. And there's a lot of history to it in Egypt, for example. You can see that in some respects, it's a competing merchant class to the one the one in Egypt, for example, to the one that aligned itself with the, the, with the regime there. But there are, you know, there are important, um, there, there are far more Syrian billionaires, most of them are exiles, who supported the Syrian revolution than Mm. The one or two that support the government, and people make a big deal about Assad's cousin, who is a billionaire, who is now starting to be disciplined. But there were several billionaires in, based in France and the and the US and Britain who were supporting the revolution. So you can't really push a class analysis too mm. far with the Syrian revolution. But your point, I think, is also right that nationalism, more generally, um, has a particular history in the imperial countries. You know, nationalism mm. in mm. France where Samir Amin was living most of his life, has an imperial past um, and a Napoleonic past, you know. Um, but in the countries that fought for their independence, national, even in India, for example, that na nationalism had, you know, the, the situation in India is different now because you have significant chauvinist tendencies. But 
The mm. Indian National Congress historically was a liberation movement effectively, and it was a way in which um, all of the anti-imperial, anti-colonial factions could come together to get rid of the, of the, of the colonizer. And whatever you say about Indian independence, you can look at the figures on education and so on. It, it was extraordinary, really. Uh, not, nothing, nothing world shattering these days, really. But if you look at, I think, literacy figures before independence was around 10 or 12 percent of adults in India. Yeah. And then within about 15 or 20 years, it was 65 percent. Like 65, like, yeah. Shot yeah. up dramatically. Of course, it stalled after that. But, you know, nationalist movements in, in Latin America all have revolutionary traditions. And so people of all sides um, identify with them. You know, I, I'm curious mm. to see some of the North Americans these days, people I respect, talking about black Venezuelans and black Cubans, you know. In Cuba, people don't say I'm Afro-Cuban. They say I'm Cuban because I'm, I'm talking about very black Cubans because they're proud of being Cuban. They identify with the tradition Um of Fidel and the revolution, but also of independence from the 19th century, which destroyed the Spanish slave system there, basically. And then Fidel, um, you know, and, and some of the white and black leaders of the Cuban revolution destroyed the remnants of racism that were still in that system there. So they don't mm. identify as Afro-Cuban. So maybe there's Afro-Cuban music and culture and so on, but they identify as Cuban. And similarly in Venezuela, there is a mm. tradition back to Bolivar, which uh, Bolivar destroyed slavery Unlike in North America, where the major founding fathers of the U.S., the Jefferson and Washington, were slave owners to the day they died. So even now, if you look at North America and Latin America, nationalism still has a very different meaning. Yeah, and uh, post-colonial nationalism is totally different, which is why I get into so many discussions and arguments with people on the left who say they, they make the assumption that nationalism is somehow fascist or they reduce fascism to, to a kind of hyped-up nationalism. Well, and sort of I understand. It sort of is in Western Sorry? cultures. And it I is, mean, it is, it is. It is. Our country, to be a hyped-up Australian nationalist, is verging on fascism, basically, because of the history and because of all the conflicts that we've been involved in and, and the causes that Australian extreme nationalism has supported. But yeah, it's very and so my, re my, yeah. my response to that is to say, well, where does this opposition to nationalism in Western leftism, Marxism come from, and it comes from the First World War. In a context where working class people are being sent to the trenches to fight and die and murder each other, and they don't know what these are for, ultimately these are wars for the ruling class, they're wars for colonies, but they don't benefit the ordinary worker who just sees another worker on, on the other side of the trenches, then it is going to create a consciousness of solidarity which, I mean, only the Bolsheviks fundamentally uh, uh, overthrew their government and, and thereby pulled out of the war. But that is actually, that's where it comes from. That's where the opposition to nationalism comes from. The First World War, when workers were, were killing each other in the millions for the rights of their respective empires to, to devour the world among themselves. Well, not just the First World War. My father was, fought in the Second World War and he... Uh, joined the second AIF, the second Australian Imperial Force. The first one was in the First World War. The second one, and so he was a 39er, he went into the army in 39 and went straight to Europe. And the Australian Imperial Force was to support the British Empire, basically. Mm. That's why they were in North Africa and Greece and Palestine and Syria. Back at that time, basically, they, were, they didn't go to fight fascism, they went to support the British Empire. It's not that long ago, basically. And um, and then, you know, I grew up with the Vietnam War and all of the rest of the wars, which were none of which I supported. So when I first went to Chile, for example, in, in the early part of this century, by coincidence, it happened to be Independence Day in the middle of September, and everyone's got the, the national flag out. And my immediate reaction then from my history is, damn, they're all, are they all closet fascists? Are they all, do they all support Pinochet mm -hmm. or something? But no, 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 it's a very popular thing to be a nationalist and to wave your national flag in Chile, despite the fact that they had an extreme nationalist, actually fascist government in the not too, you know, not, not that long ago, still they support the nationalism, the, the tradition that their country got independence from Spain and so on. So it really, it's mm. a very... Heavy even the... Even the fascist government in Chile, it did not, it wasn't externally aggressive. It wasn't externally colonizing. All of the violence was committed against internal uh, populations, dissidents, socialists, 
you know, indigenous well, groups, what have you. They, they didn't even privatise. Uh, I mean, they were terrible. But the they copper, didn't yeah. All of the mines. Why? Because the army had a legal right to some of the revenue from the, the nationalised mines there, you know. So so some things were different there. But anyway, our point is, yeah, I, I think nationalism in our culture, in Australia at least, um, has uh, very strong fascist tinges. And so I, whenever I see someone getting excited about the Australian flag, which has, you know, the butcher's apron and the Union Jack on it, which all the Irish, you know, despise for centuries, um, but you think this is someone who's in one nation or some extreme right-wing person, or maybe it's a migrant that wants to ingratiate themselves into Australian mm -hmm. society, but it's not something which the progressives and the left uh, in our country identify with because of all of the, the wars that that flag has been dragged through in our in the century and also in, in, our, in our lifetimes, including up to, you know, the Middle East these days. But the flag, a national flag, patriotism, it means something quite different in Syria where you are defending your country from mercenaries and the three occupying armies that are now sitting in Syria, mm. Israel, Turkey and the US sitting in Syria now. I think people, some of the Western leftists that we debated with many years ago said, oh, no, uh, Damascus is really in league with Israel and the US doesn't want to overthrow Assad and so on. Now you've got two NATO armies and Israel actually physically occupying Syria. What does that say yeah. about yeah. the reality back then? And the, the crop burning. I mean, I remember you, um, uh, you mentioning that. I, I retweeted it. And... Um, yeah, like uh, people who, for example, say, I support Rojava, do you support Rojava? And then my response to that is to say, well, the a better question to ask is, do you support the US occupation of northern Syria? Because, I mean, if the US wasn't illegally occupying northern Syria, then the question of supporting Rojava would, would be meaningless anyway, because there's no, there's, you got to be wary of your voice, right? If you live in a Western country and there's some phenomena happening on the other side of the world, you might think that their project is great, but there, there's no point in saying that you support it unless you can, you know, you can have some kind of interaction with it or you can have some kind of effect on the outcome. But here's a situation in which a lot of people, they say they support Rojava, um, but really what they're supporting is the US occupation of another country's territory, which is then used to facil facilitate further aggression against that country. So the the YPG has allowed the United States to launch airstrikes against the Syrian government. They've taken all of the oil, which they're not allowing to be transported to Syria, even through normal exchange, um, and they're destroying crops. I mean, there's there's basically ethnic cleansing going on. I think we should have a, a fuller discussion on that whole question um, of yeah. the Kurds in Syria at some some later stage there. Is there something else you want to say, though, about because we raised, I think it's an important issue, you know, the failure of the left effectively to uh, to be anti-war when it came to Syria. They either, you know, they either supported the war or they said this is all too difficult, we'll do nothing. I suppose still to this day, a lot of the, the Western Marxist left is in that camp, basically. And what, what are your final thoughts on, on that? What was the... What was at the root of that sort of failure to, because like I said, one of the decent things the Western left did in the past was to oppose war. And in this case, mm. they didn't. What's yeah, I mean, I think the reason why, I mean, maybe this is excessively cynical and maybe it, uh, maybe you disagree with this, but I get the feeling that the reason why the Vietnam War, for example, was opposed so fiercely is because of conscription, because there was a genuine fear that you'd be drafted off and to, to fight in some jungle and die a horrible death. And so I think that probably brought a lot of people out into the streets because there weren't similar protests against the Korean War, which was just as bloody, um, bloody for the, for the victims in the country being affected by it. Um, and I think that's one thing. The other thing is that um, I don't think a lot of Western leftists realize how beholden they are to Western exceptionalism and how Western exceptionalism prevents them from ever mobilizing for a revolution in their own country. If you believe that all of these other countries are horrible, despotic dictatorships, and it's your job to go out there and save the people in these countries from their own governments, then you're just upholding the idea that your own civilization is that much more morally superior. So, I mean, how many people in the Western left realize that if you look at the protests in the United States, so far something like 15 to 20 people have died. So like 15 to 20 people have died. Whereas in Hong Kong, where they've, where they've had protests for like the last two or three years, the number of deaths have been what, two? 
right? And one of those deaths was caused by another protester. I mean, what that tells me is that the cops in Hong Kong, not to defend police in general, because I mean, generally I don't like cops, right? But the cops in Hong Kong are probably a lot softer and a lot milder towards their own population than cops in the United States. So these kind of the the Western exceptionalist thinking has, I think, deeply infiltrated the way that a lot of Western leftists think. And this makes it difficult for them not only to oppose imperialism abroad, which is usually sold to them in terms of the savior complex, we have to go out there and save people, but it also prevents them from mounting any challenge to the ideological hegemony of their own ruling class. Yeah, yeah. Okay, well, on that note, we'll wrap up and we've probably opened up a couple of areas we can come back to in the near future. Sure. Good to talk to you, Tim. Thanks, Jay. See ya. See ya. Yeah, that.